Director this conference will uh, now be recorded. Uh, I'm a Principal Director at uh, Smart Home Immigration and my colleague uh, Subhi Mehta, who is our International Client Servicing uh, Manager, and they will also walk you through the different options. Um, so, uh, if you just start off with the with the presentation, uh, we'll go on to the next slide. Right, so uh, what we're looking at covering today is uh, obviously giving you a brief overview about, you know, what is the difference in terms of the concept between citizenship and PR, because, you know, in our experience, uh, you know, we hear people use that interchangeably. Um, so we're going to kind of walk uh, individuals through that. Um, we're going to look at some of the country profiles, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, what are the key markets and, and how does migration work on there. And uh, we'll also have some time for uh, Q&A uh, towards the end. Uh, so if you have any questions, so, you know, you can either uh, keep them in the chat box or, or, or you can save them for later and, and we will address them uh, as we get towards the, towards the end of the, the presentation. Um, so to run through the uh, introduction, I'm going to ask my colleague uh, Surbi to start off with that and uh, she'll lead in the introduction for us. Right. So, um, right, we're just gonna kick off with the with the content itself, uh, I suppose. Um, so, so first up, we're just gonna talk about the the concepts on migration. So, a lot of times, uh, people talk about uh, you know citizenship and PR, and and they tend to use the terms interchangeably. Um, it's it's quite quite pertinent to understand the difference uh, between both of those um, concepts um, in terms of citizenship as well as for uh, for PR. Um, so citizenship is when when you when you are kind of you know giving up your uh, your networking or your uh, you know the, the citizenship of one country and acquiring rights in another country. So so that's that's a complete change. So for example, you have an Indian passport and you give that up and you acquire say a Canadian passport or a British passport. That's that's the the concept of changing your citizenship. A permanent residence is, is kind of like having the best of both worlds. So you still retain your Indian citizenship, but you also acquire a permanent residence in another country. So, you know, we see a lot of people aspiring to kind of get a Canadian PR or an Australian PR or, uh, or even some of the European countries. So the idea is that they are one step away from a citizenship. So they will, they will continue to hold their Indian passports. They're still Indian nationals but they have permission to live and work in another country, uh, which gives them rights. And, and after a period of time, uh, should they wish to kind of get there, they can look at uh, kind of, you know, confirming their status and, and becoming citizens over there. Um, India at the moment doesn't allow for dual citizenship. So, so you only have a uh, citizenship of one country at a time. So you can either be a citizen of India or you could be a citizen of another country. Um, but the workaround to that, obviously, is that India does offer uh, an OCI card or Overseas Citizen of India card, uh, which is as good as a citizenship. So if you were to, to acquire a citizenship for another country, uh, you know, you can still continue to, to live and work in India and, and have investments in India with your, uh, with your OCI card. Um, in a PR scenario, obviously, that doesn't come into play, uh, the, the OCI uh, card, because you still have your Indian passport. So I think this enables you to get a clarity in terms of the concept for citizenship and PR. Uh, if you can go to the next um, slide. So one of the uh, kind of questions that we get, particularly, uh, you know, this year, uh, and, and, and that's to do with, uh, you know, will immigration still be a, be a thing, you know, given the whole impact of COVID and, you know, we're all going through, uh, through shutdowns and, uh, you know, most of us have spent a better part of three to four months uh, staying locked up at home. And, and a lot of us are still staying indoors. Um, so the question does come in to say that, okay, is, is immigration likely to continue? Um, so in the short term, we did see that, you know, countries were locking our borders and, and they still have uh, control on, on people coming in and all the rest of it. But, but over a period of, of, of time, we will see that these restrictions will go away and people will learn to adapt to it. You know, we have a history of, uh, you know, pandemics uh, over the last decade. Um, also, we take in uh, concepts like yellow fever vaccine, uh, you know, which 
which which you need to get if you're traveling to to Africa or you're traveling to Central and South America, and and it's just part of the process, you know. So we don't really think too much about it. We get the vaccines and and then we still make our travel. Um, UK as well at the moment uh, requires you to take a TB test uh, if you're going to stay for a longer duration in the UK, so more than six months. So whether you're a student, whether you're a worker, whether you are an investor or a business person, you need to take a TB test, get an all clear before you enter the UK. Um, so, so we've seen that you know um, countries have adapted and, and just the same way Canada and Australia also need you to do a health check uh, before you get a, you know, before you get a PR uh, to that country. So just as we have adapted to all of these phases, we will see this uh, coming in for COVID-19 as well. And, and in fact, we're already starting to see countries make provisions, uh, you know, where you need to get tested uh, when you enter the country, you need to carry a pre-clearance check when you're traveling. Um, and, and then obviously there's a mandatory quarantine uh, once you're in country. So we will see a short-term uh, short term blip, uh, particularly on the tourist market and, and such. But, uh, you know, we as a company haven't seen uh, a huge impact on the business migration side. Companies are still looking at expanding. Individuals are still considering setting up businesses in these markets. Um, so, so this is likely to continue uh, for, for the longer term as well. Right, can we uh, get the next slide? Yeah, so we've covered that part about the UK requiring the uh, the TB test uh, and and all the rest of it. Now, first up, in in terms of when we look at options, uh, you know, it is uh, it, the US is the number one country for uh, for, for for migrants around the world, and um, and uh, you know, despite the current administration, despite what we think about Trump and and, and the Republicans at the moment, um, India is the third largest source country for migration to the US. Uh, Mexico obviously takes the front spot because of the border that it shares and, and there's a lot of traffic between US and Mexico on account of NAFTA and, uh, and, and its proximity. Uh, China comes in next, but we all know that, you know, with the current situation, obviously China is falling out of favor and, and we're likely to see some uh, impact uh, of this uh, as we go along. Um, India is the third largest uh, kind of source country uh, for, for the US. And, and typically the reasons why people choose to migrate to the US ranges from kind of having family out there uh, or, or you know, businesses wanting to take advantage of the infrastructure and the, about the, um, the standard of living, the hub for innovation that it offers, and, and also kind of the friendlier uh, tax structures, depending on which state you are incorporated and, and you know, uh, where you are living. And, and even from a, a you know a personal income tax point of view, the tax rates in the U.S. are fairly competitive. Uh, you know in that regard, um, particularly given you know what is the value uh, that you get out of it. Um, just quickly looking at what are the routes uh, available for uh, for migration um, to the U.S. Uh, so if we were to go to the next slide. So typically, when we look at the business migration options in the U.S., so you know, obviously, you have, uh, you know, you do have uh, uh, the H-1B visas, the student visas, which which obviously form a pathway to to the U.S. But if you're looking at slightly more longer term options, um, then you know, we see a lot of uh, traffic on the L-1 visas, which is uh, typically for uh, companies based outside of the U.S that are looking at setting up operations in the US uh, where you know, they will be looking at uh, nominating a senior manager or a technical person um, to enter the US and, uh, and, and you know, to work uh, in, in the US. Uh, generally, this requires that uh, you know, the business will set up a uh, in the US uh, at that particular point. Um, so that's one route which is very, very popular. Another route that we see a lot of traction on, uh, particularly from the high net worth individuals, is uh, is you know the EB-5 visas, uh, which typically require people to make an investment of at least uh, you know four crores uh, in the US. Um, now again, this is a good option for the passive investors. So you know if you don't want to do anything, you just want to kind of you know um, make a passive investment and get a green card for yourself and your family. Then, then obviously the EB-5 is a is a viable viable option. Um, 
as a business, we also see a lot of people looking at making investments uh, into the US without looking at the, uh, you know, the part in terms of uh, the, the, the migration aspect of it kind of a thing. Um, so, so as a business, we also advise uh, companies and individuals who want to make an investment in the US um, just to kind of gather, uh, you know, better returns uh, on, on, on investment opportunities and such. Uh, one of the less known routes in the US in terms of migration is, uh, is the E2 visas. And, uh, and, and if you go to the next slide, uh, we, we, can, we can get a bit more light about this. So the E2 is a very unique uh, entry point to the USA because what the US does is uh, it, has a, it has a treaty with countries uh, which are on a prescribed list. And uh, there are countries like Grenada, Turkey, there's Bangladesh, there's Pakistan, uh, there's uh, even Sri Lanka on that list. Uh, India and China are not on that list, so, so the US does not have an E2 treaty with India and China. Um, but what it actually means is, if you are a citizen of, uh, say, a treaty country like, say, Grenada or Turkey, you can get an automatic entry into the US if you were to just present a business concept and say, I want to run a business, any business in the US. So it could be a franchise business, it could be a coffee shop, it could be a supermarket or a petrol station, whatever you decided, um, you could apply for an entry clearance to the US uh, on an E2 treaty. Now, this is a two-stage process. The first stage is obviously getting a citizenship for a treaty country. Now, obviously, other countries like Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, uh, they're not offering citizenships and, and you know, people wouldn't prefer that. Uh, but there are countries like Grenada and Turkey where you could get a citizenship in six months time and uh, and you can make an investment in real estate. So, so it's a really simple process. You know, somebody buys a property or makes an investment in a luxury hotel chain in Grenada or Turkey. They invest about $220,000 uh, or, or $250,000 in Turkey's case, get the passport in six months time. And, uh, and then they say that, you know, they're going to make another investment in the US, which is for another 100,000 or $150,000. So half the price of an EB-5 uh, investment, which is 900,000, and, uh, and you get all the benefits in terms of a fast track into the process, um, ability to enter the US with your family members, and, 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 and it's a really seamless, uh, seamless route. And, and the good part about this is, your investment in Granada and Turkey also gives you returns. So, so it's a it's a win-win situation in that regard, where you know you are able to uh, you know you are able to kind of uh, leverage that as an opportunity, uh, which is really great uh, as an as an entry clearance route uh, into the US. And and this is this is very uh, interesting because the countries themselves, which is uh, Granada and Turkey, they offer a lot of uh, you know incentives themselves. So if you're a Grenadian passport holder you can get visa-free travel to 120 countries. So you could go and stay in Europe for six months in a year without having to apply for a visa, which is great. Um, if you're a Turkish national, you get access to about uh, you know, 100 countries. It's kind of gone off from the 77 that you see on the list. And if you're a business person, setting up a business in Turkey allows you to access the whole of the Schengen market area as well which is a big plus when it comes to um, comes to growing your business internationally. So, so that's one of the key advantages, uh, you know, that you could look at in terms of citizenship by investment, which is not only to scale up your business and get these opportunities, but to also get a little bit of extra on the back of it. Now, if you were to quickly jump onto the next slide. So, like we said, you know, we, we offer in a full service proposition, you know, so our, um, our consulting is not only limited to sorting out the, the legal side of things in terms of the immigration, uh, but we also help to identify business opportunities. We have teams in country that provide you with business support um, in country. And, uh, you know, based on our research, we've identified kind of top 10 uh, business opportunities in the US. And uh, those include areas like uh, online marketing, uh, pet care, e-commerce, and, and this is a recent update. I mean, so this data is current as of February 2020. And if you see, um, these industries, despite the COVID crisis, 
still represent a, a good opportunity in terms of the investment, still represent a good opportunity in terms of starting a business in the US and, and getting some returns. So, you know, we are able to help uh, people identify investment options in these industries, or if they want to migrate to the US and if they have businesses in any of these areas, then, then you know, we are able to present, uh, you know, present a, a, a wonderful pathway for, for individuals to kind of work through. Um, if you can have the next slide, please. Right. So, so the other country that I wanted to talk to you a little bit about was uh, was Canada, and Canada is one of the most uh, popular countries at the moment for migration. Whether you are a professional or whether you're a business person, um, it seems like the only country at the moment which is allowing people in with uh, with you know open arms and uh, without a lot of restrictions. Um, you know, so people have a lot of restrictions when they want to migrate to any of the other countries around the world, even in India. Uh, but Canada is the exception to the norm at the moment. You know, they have the most friendlier immigration policies uh, right now. And uh, India is third on the list of migrants entering Canada at the moment. Uh, we're behind China and the UK uh, when it comes to sending people into Canada. Um, people love, uh, you know, the, uh, the free education, the health care, the wonderful quality of life that they would get in Canada. Um, and, and the best part about starting a business is that there is minimal government regulations when it comes to starting the businesses in Canada. So, so it's very friendly in, in, that, in that context. And I think it works, works really well uh, to kind of, you know, um, start or consider an option to migrate. Um, if we look at the next uh, slide. So again, Canada has multiple pathways um, to, to kind of, you know, enter in. And uh, so the first one is the Express Entry Program. This is uh, on a points-based system, um, which basically suited for professionals. So if you are somebody who's got a bachelor's degree or a master's degree, you've got at least three years of work experience and you can speak English to a, a reasonably good standard, um, then, you know, Express Entry is a program that allows you to apply for uh, migration to Canada without a job offer. So you could actually land in country and, and you could look for work opportunities when you are there. And, uh, and, and, and that's a fantastic route for qualified professionals. Um, Canada also has provinces uh, which, uh, which can give you endorsements or which have certain specialist skills which they need. So, you know, teachers are in demand in certain states, uh, primary carers are in demand in certain other states. So if you have a job profile which fits that requirement, rather than going down the express entry pool where it could get really busy, you could choose a, you know, a provincial program which will, which will enable you to ensure that you know, you're able to, to, to plan your migration journey better. Um, student pathway is another popular area to, to enter into Canada uh, because it kind of builds into uh, people wanting to do bachelor's degrees or master's degrees and then they get a post-study work visa at the end of their course and uh, then they can score extra points on the express entry because they have a Canadian degree, they have a Canadian work experience. So it's, it's a win-win situation. And, and the best part is that a Canadian degree is not that expensive. So the cost of living is, is reasonably cheaper compared to other international uh, destinations. Uh, the cost of a degree is a lot more cheaper as well. So, so it creates another win-win, uh, you know, scenario for for individuals uh, to to be able to to leverage that as an opportunity. And and the third aspect around is is the provincial pathway for investors. Uh, so again, just like uh, the work opportunities, you can pick a particular province or a state, and uh, you know you can look at setting up a business. This route is is generally preferred for uh, individuals who may not have uh, you know professional qualifications, who may not have a bachelor's degree or a master's degree, and uh, you know who may not have uh, kind of uh, you know a, a higher level of English language skills, but you know who do have some savings, who do have some net worth, and and you know you can look at making an application uh, under this particular pathway. If you could just uh, move to the next slide, please. So, so just to give you a flavor about, you know, how the investor program works and what are the typical ticket sizes. So, so Canada has a kind of a three tier system uh, when it comes to investments. Uh, at the top tier, you could probably look at a province like uh, Ontario, uh, where, where Toronto is a city in. 
and and that's where you need a very high level of investment and and a high level of net worth at the second level you have british columbia which is uh, you know vancouver is one of the key cities in there and it offers a fantastic opportunity uh, you know for for a nominal investment to buy a business and to to live in one of the best cities in fact vancouver is ranked in one of the top 3 cities to live in the world uh, and for the last 4 years running it's it's, it's been in the top 3 so, so you know definitely a great place to, to to kind of look at especially if you have a young family and and if you're looking at uh, the migration option and and lastly on that list is uh, provinces like yukon and manitoba which uh, which have a very lesser uh, investment requirement because they tend to be the smaller population centers um, in, in Canada. But uh, in our opinion, we see a lot of traction for, for provinces like British Columbia, uh, because you know it has a hub in terms of good industries, uh, the cost of living is relatively cheaper, and, and it offers some fantastic uh, business options as well. So if you could go to the next slide, please. Right, so this kind of takes us to across the pond, uh, which is in uh, Europe and, and UK. And to kind of tell you a little bit more about that, uh, I'm gonna uh, kind of invite my, my colleague, her name is Falguni Parikh, she's a solicitor and she's a principal partner at Smart Move Immigration. Um, so uh, I'll hand you over to her and uh, she's gonna walk you through the options uh, for UK and, and in Europe. Hello. Good evening, everybody. I hope everybody is having a good time. And uh, uh, thank you so much, Mr. Iman, for all those insights uh, right from US to Canada. Uh, it was quite interesting. Um, and now we move on to United Kingdom. Um, so basically, to begin with, uh, I'll introduce myself. I'm Falguni Pari. I'm a solicitor from the United Kingdom and uh, I have been practicing in um, immigration laws and nationality laws for the past 15 years. I have regularly been interviewed on BBC World News. Um, I also have given my opinion on immigration matters in a uh, lot of national and international media houses. And um, I will today uh, try to um, I'll give you an insight about the uh, United Kingdom as a destination, which is uh, getting very, very popular. In fact, migration overall is getting a lot of momentum and popularity. It's just become more of a necessity uh, from a business perspective, as well as from the uh, high network clients who are looking out for a plan B or are looking out for uh, uh, another option for, for the offsprings that they have so uh so migration is becoming quite a, a popular um uh, subject even within in india um now coming to the united kingdom uh, why is uk particularly uh, preferred as a destination uh, if we go into some insight with regards to the same you would say a it's a very very strong and stable economy it has been a part of a european union uh, but has still kept most of uh, its important uh, aspects uh, to themselves. Like, for instance, even if they were a part of the European Union, you would still require standalone visas to go to the UK. Uh, the Schengen visas would not work. Uh, they didn't merge the currencies. The currencies for the pound sterling remained standalone as opposed to the euros. It didn't merge that. So, so with, with our whatever changes that have transpired in the economy, um, the United Kingdom has been a very, very strong and stable uh, economy. And, and, and I personally, in my experience, I've been advising clients all over, not only in India, I've got clients from Middle East, I've got clients from Africa and uh, uh, from Japan, Germany, all over these places. Um, particularly from India, when I speak, I think we have a lot of uh, opportunity. If you are into a kind of a business which is uh, related to, say, um, production or you're in kind of services so uh, the kind of companies we have helped in they they are into a production of say leather or uh, leather goods or they are into a production of diamonds or jewelry businesses etc so if you are producing 
uh, in India and you you happen to sell or you aim to sell in UK or European Union markets, then obviously you have a very, very greater advantage of cost uh, and, and the benefits that you will reap in terms of profits and, and the exchange rates benefits that you would get in uh, is a very strong reason on why uh, businesses aim looking uh, at UK as one of their favorite destinations. Um, the second for ease of doing business in Europe, so uh, as per the World Bank record, it's one of the very easiest place in the entire Europe to do business. Literally in, in UK, you could start a company in, in an, within an hour. Uh, a company can get incorporated in the company house and you could be up and running. It's that very simple to start a business in the UK. Um, of course, it has an advancement of technology and commercialism and a lot of law and processes properly set in place uh, for businesses to run. They have an excellent healthcare uh, and education. Um, UK has always been known to impart as the best education in, in, in there. It's one of the very good educational hubs. Um, in terms of healthcare, it has an NHS, uh, National Health Services, which has been offered by the government there, which is, is, which is available. Um, Personal tax rates of about 20%, that too, it starts at the rate of 12,500. I, I personally made a point to incorporate tax rates here because I've been told by Mr. Uh, Ram Mohan Bhavi that there's going to be a lot of chartered accountants and people from finances uh, who would be, I'm sure, very keen to know about what would be the taxation structures like. So, um, so this is what the tax rates are like. The corporate tax rate is about 18%. And, um, and, and in this very difficult time that uh, there is a coronavirus and there's a COVID-19 and the businesses have slowed down or are been suffering, uh, the government's been very supportive. There's a lot of uh, funds which has been allocated. Um, there's a lot of uh, business rate holidays been granted. There's cash grants, there's support loans. Which has been uh, which has been uh, provided by the UK government, uh, so so that it can um, try to help the businesses to do as much as they can uh, in this difficult scenario. So uh, this is about why United Kingdom, and if you statistically look into, uh, it's got an Indian population about eight eight hundred and forty thousand from India, which is second in the list. Uh, and it's, it's kind of referred to that extent. Um, let me please have the next slide. Can we go to the next slide, please? Yes. So um, in United Kingdom, just like in India that we have, uh, there are places which are very, very popular, like London, etc. but then that's very expensive as well. And then you have places which are, um, which we could suggest is, is in a very close proximity to the UK. And uh, we could save on the living cost, and uh, and we can be still close to the business arenas which are within the UK, uh, especially in London. So, for instance, if you are around, say, in Oxford or Reading, Southampton, Bristol, you are uh, just uh, is very closely connected to tubes, trains, uh, by roads, and you could reach there quite easily in terms of commuting. It's quite quite easily connected. Uh, if you look at the average rentals, they're quite very, very reasonable, leaving about £13,836 per annum. So, so uh, you could save quite a lot. If you are like, you know, especially in the initial days when migrants enter into, you try to look into uh, uh, the best possible scenarios, uh, especially because with the initial entry, uh, you would want to be a bit more conservative in terms of uh, the expenses, etc. So these are our suggestions. This could be your top cities to live in the UK. And um, in terms of setting up investment companies, uh, you could have student accommodations, which is about 7.5% net per annum for three years. And um, then IT uh, companies, which are which are gaining a lot of popularity in the UK, and uh, fintech companies. There's we, we ourselves as a company have a lot of webinars running on to uh, where we discuss with the fintech companies, innovating companies, innovators particularly, who would want to kind of go left, right and center in, in terms of their innovation and, and would want to capture most part of the geographies 
uh, not confining themselves within India, but they would want to expand, say, in the European market and as well as in the US and, and other parts. So um, these are the countries that would welcome and they are looking out for such kind of businesses to enter. And uh, of course, uh, the immigration policies are very uh, conducive for such businesses to um, start running in their country. Can I go to the next slide, please? So these are among the top investment opportunities that we've just discussed. And um, now giving you an overview about what could be a possible ways. So um, very interestingly, uh, when we discuss with our clients, uh, uh, there are various ways to get into any country. That could be either by investments, where you know you obviously, as uh, we were laughing when we began this uh, uh, webinar with Mr. Ramahan Pave uh, to say uh, you can go anywhere so long as you can show them the money because that speaks the universal language. Uh, well, here again, the topping all the routes is the tier one investor routes where lesser questions been asked uh, since there's a lot of investment and investment amount is grouping about two million pounds but sometimes it's not an issue because uh, the companies have strategized uh, the, the their uh, their entire programs or a high net worth clients have particular uh, ideas in their mind on why they would want to uh, enter so investment route can become a very viable option to enter into, it's a, it's a very quick route to get into the country. And um, the, the good part is when, when I kind of, because I have a lot of experience advising on immigration and when I kind of sit down and, and try to evaluate or give clients an option, um, I think uh, these are the fine points which one should consider when we're thinking about investment is for instance, USA would also have an investor visa through EB-5 route. But there, uh, the, the government kind of insists that you uh, invest in a regional center or one of the programs run by them there. However, in UK, with your uh, monies that you're entering in this country, you can invest in your own company. So you are looking into doing uh, uh, the investment by yourself in your own company. Uh, plus, because I said you are investing the uh, investing the money in the businesses. Uh, they don't ask you for English. Uh, they, don't, they don't ask you quite a lot of things about your education, qualifications, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, they're very, very liberal. They're very happy to see the money and they're very warm welcoming the red carpet when goes out uh, for investors uh, up over there. But it's a price that you're paying there. That's uh, about two million pounds to enter into the investor route up over there. Uh, there are investors from India. Uh, this trend again for past three years has been on an increase. There's a lot of uh, investors from India looking UK as a destination and, and signing into under this route to enter the uh, enter the UK, which is a tier one investor route. So in UK there are 12 as tiers. There's a uh, all categories are tier one to tier five and then there's some categories out of the tiers which are how they uh, kind of um, kind of um, uh, speak about the immigrations in UK. Uh, the next two categories are quite interlinked and uh, generally we need to, uh, when we when we kind of interact with the client at the first level, uh, we need to know on what is your plan for the company, what is it that you need to do uh, and how, how, does, how, does, how do you as a company perceive this, such kind of an expansion programs and, and then we kind of advise you on which would suit you the best uh, in, in terms of your scenario or uh, the stage of uh, uh, your preparations or, or your preparedness to enter uh, a new country and, and, and the plans that the company has in mind. Now, for general sponsorship license is, is, is something where you can set up a company in the UK and it doesn't require you any investment, which is a good part. It's not asking you any kind of an investment, which was in our uh, previous uh, category that I just discussed with you. So in here, um, you can just set up a company and you could procure a license that would allow you to uh, move in your own talented people from your own company here to UK or anywhere in the world. So you could have branches in say USA or Germany or, uh, or in, uh, 
uh, in Australia and, and, and you would want to move your talent to the UK because you're now entering a new country and you want somebody who knows about the work or a team of your people to, to enter in and, and start. Then the Turkish sponsorship license is for you. Also under this license, you can take on global talent. So assuming you have registered and you have uh, requested for this license, so under this license, not only you can move in your own people from your own companies, setups that you have uh, already in existence, or you can bring in more talent uh, from across the globe and, and, and that would add value to your businesses in the UK. So here's where Toyota sponsorship license would help you. Also, you can move in the key personnel in your company under this rule. So you could have directors can also get transferred uh, under this rule. So you could have a graduate trainees, you could have experienced people, and you could have uh, people right up to the director level if you would want them to go in that. Uh, and, and then there is various other things that you have to comply under a way. And, and there's a huge list up over there, which is quite exhaustive. Uh, but the main thing about here is they have a salary requirement under each slab. And this salary requirement is in line with the local UK employment laws and, 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 and particularly in, in this immigration part where you're trying to call in a foreign nationals to, um, to work in the UK. So you need to comply with those rights. So why is this attractive to the company? It, the whole reason why this attracts the company is because you're not committed to bringing any kind of an investment. Uh, you're not committing them uh, for the investment. You are just merely showing that there is a prospect for your kind of a work or your kind of a business, and that prospect requires human resources or a set skill of people who can, whom you have chosen and who can represent your business. So this could be the people whom you have trained in your home country. These are the people who have worked with you who kind of know what they have to do once they are out uh, and they know their job duties and responsibilities or this can be for you to get in more talent uh, for your kind of a businesses to grow uh, uh, grow in a better way in a foreign country so just sponsor license work very well for such company and as smart immigration we've done uh, n number of an applications under this categories uh, we have this, we have represented um, companies from various uh, different industries. Uh, it could be into pharmaceutical companies, it could be industrials, it could be uh, something as simple as prescription glasses. And somebody who's manufacturing prescription glasses here, uh, IT companies, um, fintech companies. Uh, uh, these are the companies that we have worked with there's n number of companies that we work with you could go to our company's website and you could get through the testimonials uh, we've got a um, um, a video page we've got a youtube page where you could see about the work that we've got, we have done for various industries uh, and we strategize the whole move in terms of how many people will go at the first inception how many should we take in at later stages what are the total number of people that are going to go in, and how are we going to uh, um, how are we going to plan the whole uh, of this migration and global mobility for uh, the company and the individuals working with the companies there? So a lot of companies prefer this, and uh, as I said, the bottom line for the company and why the company prefer this is because there's no commitment for investment, uh, and and it's a uh, uh, very easy, you just incorporate the company, you get them registered with the general offices in the UK. There's a few compliances that we go through with, which is fine and very easy to do in kind of, and we can start having the business there. So, um, check your sponsorship licenses for that one. I hope I'm audible, I hope I am able to um, not overwhelm you with the information. Uh, please, could you, uh, could you please? Uh, the audience will send me responses if uh, I am uh, you are able to understand in terms of uh, the categories which have been discussed so far. I think I hope everybody's still there. <laughs> 
Okay, sorry, we're not finished the slide. Sorry, can we go? Um, sorry, we're going to go behind the slide. We just haven't finished it as yet. Thank you. All right. So the other category we have is a sole representative visas. Um, the very word of sole means one person, just one person. And in this case, uh, you know, sometimes businesses do think that there's a prospect for them, there's an opportunity for them to do a business outside. However, they're not very sure. They don't. They don't want to take a team of people. They, they're not looking at hiring global talent because obviously you have to pay them in in GDP unless they start performing and things like those. So there's a lot of thought processes that goes in there. And in the interim, you could apply for a sole representative leader. So herein, you just nominate one person up over there who is a senior most person and uh, who is an experienced person with your company, and that person can go in incorporate a company test waters and uh, they can start their operations in the UK. So a very minimum, the, the most minimum investment that goes in uh, to start uh, a corporation in the UK is under the sole representative category. Uh, obviously, the proprietors can nominate the family members uh, and uh, the most important aspect under this category is the applicant should not be a partner or majority shareholder. The other one, which is also something that is, um, right, Koresh, hi. Um, okay, all right, I see people are asking questions. Uh, I will quickly address so that, you know, we can focus on other categories. So, Ani, uh, PR visas for UK, uh, there aren't any uh, at the moment. So, all if you're going to to, um, to, to general, then you would get a permanent residency after five years uh, under that route. Sole representative is also permanent residency, and tier one investor is also permanent residency. But you don't have anything like uh, in Canada that you have. So you don't have anything like a point-based system uh, like you have for skill migration in Canada. Unfortunately, you did have that in past, uh, which is called a HSNP, and then it was called a tier one. Uh, general and then everything is gone uh, abolished and now they only have investor route so investor route is also a permanent residency so uh, those are permanent residency apart from this there's no other category of visas which can allow you for permanent residency for uk uh, but nine out of ten times i understand your question uh, the permanent residency for uk will not be like if you see in uh, australia uh, permanent residency program or Canada permanent residency program, they haven't really come up with anything uh, since the abolishment that has happened for HSMP programs. Uh, Parish, hi, um, and you're looking at for a sponsorship license option for UK uh, if you move in as a director from India to UK. Yes, the directors get permanent residency, yes. And that is one of the reasons why um, companies uh, opt into signing for um, tier two sponsorship licenses, and in turn, uh, not only uh, business interests are being um, covered, but you could also uh, cover your personal interests here if you're looking at for, um, uh, say, um, a better life for your children, and you're looking at the UK as your uh, as, as a country uh, for your plan B or or country for settling down in a very, very long run. So yes, they can be. Um, yes, Ripple, there is going to be a lot of changes. Very interestingly, you've been now, uh, I think Ripple, you've been uh, following up the immigration rules, which is very good. Uh, that's going to change. The tier two immigration rule, which will come in uh, January 2021. Uh, what would happen, the main, the main, the very main key thing that will happen is they will take away uh, the residence labor market test, uh, which will make it very easy for uh, companies to take on board or lost people. And sometimes now it's why we only apply for licenses, but we're not uh, moving people. So a lot of companies are, are doing this at this moment is because it's locked down. Uh, licenses take some time to get up and running. So they're taking those and then it will become very easy to move in people in and out because the, the policies are going into the point-based system 
but they will get uh, points for the age, the points for the work experiences and, 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 and English proficiency and things like those and, and it will become very easy and, and from the company's perspective which is at this moment uh, a biggest hurdle and, and something that the companies are very discouraged uh, to see is they wouldn't want to uh, go to the resident labor market test uh, when they are hiring a general pool of talent of people uh, and, and general and, and moving their own resources also under the general visa category because that in turn allows them a permanent residency. Uh, I think this comes as a bigger dis discouragement for them uh, when they have to go to the restricted labor market test. But Ripple, you could also sign in for our um, newsletters or you could go to our website. Our website is very, very regularly updated with everything new that's happening up over there. And you would find lots of information, there's tons of blogs up over there. Uh, every single thing that changes in UK immigration nationalized laws, you would have a first hand information on our website. So please follow our website uh, and, uh, and, uh, and also at this moment, more insight could be found on tier two. There's very many things that's going to change and come into existence on 1st January 2021. Please, please go to our um, uh, please go to our website for that one there. Uh, brilliant. Yes, we do help you to get tier two sponsorship. I, I, we don't really help you to get an employer. The employer has to be found by you. But if you are a company who would want to register, that's where we could provide you an assistance with. Uh, but we can't, we can't really help you because we're not an employment uh, agency. We are an immigration law firm. Um, Ami, is there any entry for job seekers in the UK? No, that's exactly what we were talking about a minute ago, that uh, they've abolished uh, all these categories for job seekers. So unless you have an employer who, uh, who is willing to take you on board, uh, there's really no option by an employee by themselves to kind of apply for a visa in the UK. But we're running through this option. So I mean, if you're working with a company and you know, the company has an expansion program in mind, then perhaps we could uh, look into maybe a tier two or a sole representative category for you, etc. Yeah. All right, people. Um, yes, you're welcome for uh, uh, the information that you receive. Uh, we've got to another category, which is very different from the ones that we saw so far. So the investor was different. The tier two sponsorship license was different. The sole representative was different. As a company, we've done a lot of work in sole representative uh, visas. In fact, there's a very big article covered in uh, the newspaper, which is a very popular newspaper called the Pioneer. And uh, it, it says about the work because uh, for us, uh, this sole representative visa is a very apt category for the SMEs, especially to enter the UK and, and, and start its operation and, and, and flourish. And that's how we will grow faster uh, especially the SMEs from India, uh, if you're looking to branch out, then this is the very apt route. And as a firm for the last 15 years, we've done lots of good work in here. And uh, there's a lot of information that has been written on sole representative visas on our company website. So, um, so we can, uh, you can go to that one there. The next category that you have here is um, the innovator visas or the startup visas. Now this is, uh, this is a very in thing, uh, even in India, uh, and, and every country is looking out for another uh, Google to come up, another Facebook founder, they're looking out for another Uber, or they're looking out for another um, Apple, uh, they're looking out for a Steve job, basically, uh, another Steve job to, to enter. So here is where innovation comes in. Innovation is something that you are uh, very uh, new in the market. And that is where you know the companies are interested to, uh, to the countries are also interested to follow upon in uh, under this category, which is the innovator category. So um, sorry. So innovator is is, is a route. Uh, if you have a very innovative idea, then uh, yes, this is an opportunity for you. If you want to just go um, all around with within India and outside, then you can do it. A lot of tech companies are entering under this innovator categories. Uh, and, and, and here, because your idea is the key, the, the idea 
on which is viable, the idea which is very innovative, the idea which is uh, which which could be a scalable, which is something that has a probability to uh, capture and, and scale up the market. Then uh, this is uh, this is this is why they are loving you in their country. And because it's that great idea that they're looking out for, uh, the investment that you see is only fifty thousand pounds, which is absolutely fifty lakh rupees. Now, even with this. There's not an um, endorsement company. So these other companies who will sit and see if your idea is really innovative or not are willing to even fund you for that 50 person. And there's a lot of financial institutions within UK. If you are um, if you are approved that this is a brilliant idea, it's a very innovative idea, this is scalable, this is uh, this is something that is uh, viable. Then, uh, then even there's a lot of finances available, uh, and they give you a lot of support. They give you uh, marketing support. They handhold you, uh, and and they stand by you because if you flourish, then there is also uh, some sort of uh, interest that they will have in in you becoming that big Steve job in, in the UK. So, innovator visa is something that UK has come up with. Uh, you do require an endorsement from an endorsing body. So obviously, when you think it's an innovative idea, but if they don't think it's an innovative idea, it's not viable, it's not scalable, it's not something that will work in uh, the market because these people are experienced, then uh, then you may not get through. But if they agree to your plans, you presented it well, then uh, this endorsing body is a designated people who will allow you to. Um, to enter the UK. Also, there's a startup visas for somebody who's starting up. Um, this needs to be very carefully designed in, whether you go in startup visas or innovative visas, you need to be very mindful on what is the end, where do you see yourself. So for instance, innovator uh, will be subject to extensions because you will not only have to lay the ideas, but you have to work on it and build it up. And only when you're able to see it through, Will you get settlement in the UK? Uh, same with the startup visa. So startup visas, yes, they will allow you at an inception with somebody who's got a, a, a very young and who's come up with ideas and these are endorsed by the uh, the endorsing body. But then eventually you have to switch under one of the other categories to remain in the UK. So this thought processes needs to be. Uh, to be properly formulated before you take steps uh, to sign in under one of these categories, make an application. Because the last thing you want is to enter the country, put in all the effort, put in all the hard work, and then you don't have any immigration rights, and you are asked to backpack and go, which would be a very, very sorry state at that moment. If we have not really planned this properly, and we don't really have a solid plan, to, um, to ensure that if the business grows, there's no way that uh, you get out of the equation and, and you are asked to leave and, and you leave all your hard work behind there because that would be very, very frustrating. So with any of these categories or combination of these categories, you could always reach to us. Uh, we can understand your businesses, understand your objectives, uh, and in light of what we want to achieve as an end result, we can formulate, strategize a plan, uh, have an investment or budget in mind to say, this is what we okay to, to kind of spend, and uh, this is where, or we could frame it stage-wise to say, let's begin with something small, and then uh, we will, as we grow, uh, we will uh, kind of put in more kind of an investment, and, and this is where we will see the end results. So as a firm, uh, we work very closely with a lot of corporate houses. We work with a lot of MNC companies. We're currently working with the Japan company, who is uh, who is already in in India at this moment and now venturing in the UK. And that's where we are playing a part. We've done a lot of USA-based companies, whom we have strategized and moved them to the UK. And a lot of, of course, Indian companies, whom we have uh, the MNCs, the limited companies, the private limited the Hindu undivided families uh, and, and partnerships and all entities. We've worked with multiple entities and, and have, uh, have strategized moves for them 
so that they can have their presence in the UK and, and, and they are in compliance with the immigration and, and uh, we meet the end objectives for which they have entered, uh, entered the UK. Uh, Raj, sorry, your question was about Canada and since we were speaking about UK, uh, I wasn't, but uh, does your company have been job placements abroad if the offer says to Canada is already initiated and obtained? Uh, no, unfortunately not. Uh, we can only assist if uh, uh, you have signed in with us. So it's uh, an advantage uh, which is passed on to our clients who have processed the permanent residency uh, applications to us. Um, so this is about business migrations predominantly. There's a lot of other routes up over there and um, uh, to enter the UK and uh, there's a whole lot of gamut uh, and, and as uh, you know that UK laws are very volatile, they're quite prone to changes. There's a lot of changes that's going to happen in the next six months uh, after the Brexit happens, which is which is where UK exits from the European Union, and uh, and, and there's going to be a lot, uh, lot of changes that's going to transpire in the immigration uh, policies there. So um, as I speak to you, these are the key business migration options. Uh, should you wish to know more options available, please feel free to contact us uh, through our websites, on our telephone numbers, on our email addresses, which will be uh, which will be flashed in some time uh, as, as we reach towards the end of this uh, this presentation. Um, I hope I have uh, I've been able to explain. Uh, though it's very very brief, there's a lot of fine points. There's quite a lot that can go into the discussion, uh, and there's a lot of experience sharing that we can do, uh, and a lot of permutation combinations that can be uh, can can be considered while discussing any of these categories up all here, but we are restrained with time uh, and it becomes sometimes too overwhelming to get so much of an information. Uh, so uh, if you are interested in anything in particular, you can feel free to book a consultation with us and we can go into getting the specifics about you making these applications under these categories. Um, can we please now move on to the next slide? Can we move on to the next slide, please? Brilliant. So, um, from UK, now we go to the European Union, uh, the Europe, uh, the Golden Visas, all across in the Europe, and uh, there's uh, again the whole list up over there. Uh, can I get the full slide, please? Thank you very much. Thank you. No, uh, yes. So um, that's about UK, and I'm not taking you very far away from here now. We are just around places of uh, UK, which is the European Union, which is the Europe, and uh, Shah Rukh Khan's favorite place. We've seen in a lot of movies that the real Europe is on the roads, uh, very well connected to each other. Uh, just take off your car, and you could drive all along and you could start from UK because that's where if you have uh, started or you have ventured in or you have started your uh, businesses then um, you are very in a very close proximity to all of this. Uh, I was just speaking in my uh, previous slide about the possibility of Brexit. It's not a possibility, it's for sure now happening uh, in this December 2020 uh, and so uh, with Brexit UK will uh, move out of the European Union. However, what is the bottom line at this moment is what as an immigration um, lawyer that I can say is, is from the business perspective, you are still in geographically very close to all these European countries. And sometimes making this decision to be placed in, uh, in, in say UK or one of the European country simply has changed the dynamics of all the businesses. It has changed on how your clients perceive you, it's changed on how your vendors perceive you, it's given an upper edge in terms of the bargains that you have with your, uh, with the people that you're going to supply your uh, goods or services, uh, because your registered office address has changed. And that has changed the entire dynamic. So 
in class I have worked with uh, people in clothing, we met in manufacturing, we met with designers, and they said that you know when they were uh, speaking to international clients and they were saying they're from India and we just got it in India and things like those, there's a lot of bargains and, and quality to be maintained, etc. But uh, some of them have got this benefit when they have moved to uh, UK or Europe, where uh, you know um, they have got a better deals and, and lesser negotiations, and it was easier for them to uh, get through with uh, international clients, and 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 they are absolutely business uh, horizon has broadened. Now, moving from away from UK, if you're looking at one of the uh, European countries. Uh, they have more popularly called as a golden visas, uh, which is offered by a lot of this European country uh, like Portugal, Malta, Greece, uh, Spain, Cyprus, St. Lucia, uh, St. Kitts. You, you could name it and you could go in one of so Grenada is one of the other countries that we have just spoken to in, uh, in, in the conversation that we had with our director, Mr. Imam Laharu, uh, Dominica, Antigua. Cyprus, so there's any number of options available in the European Union. And uh, generally, this four categories allow you to work, do business, or study in Portugal, and it, it allows you a permanent residency in Europe. So uh, again, I'll go back to our initial conversation about citizenship and permanent residency. And in Europe, if you don't really want to give up your Indian passport, you don't want to give away your Indian nationality, then you uh, focus on uh, getting this a PR, which is a permanent residency in one of these countries in the Europe. And you don't really give away your passports there. So it opens up your doorway, but you're still an Indian national. It opens up uh, your gateways to do businesses or travel, opens up um, free visa travels. But sometimes it, it's just that you always have got a Schengen visa. And uh, you always were being permitted to enter, but just when that important meeting came in, uh, your visa got refused. And it's just got refused because you forgot to give a bank statement, you forgot to give one of the documents, and it becomes a nightmare. And just when you have to be really, really there and you're not able to go there, it becomes very uh, frustrating. Also, sometimes it just is helpful to have a doorways open for multiple countries. If you have a doorways open for 26 countries, and tomorrow you get a better deal or a good contract coming in, you could just fly off and sign in uh, your businesses there. Sometimes some businesses also require you to be to be more present in those parts. So the warmth of you being there helps you to, to kind of get more businesses there. So here are your options uh, which you can which you can avoid to enter in one of these. Uh, countries, which is the European country. May I request another slide, please? So within this, um, as you see, that there is various ways. There's either you donate money to them, like Malta, you give them a donation of one million euros, and you can get citizenship. Um, Cyprus, you have to do an investment, and they have a list. Uh, in which you can do an investment and you can get citizenship. So now we're talking about citizenship, we're not talking about permanent residency. This is uh, you properly getting your passports there. So Bulgaria as well, uh, you have to do an investment. They have bonds in which you have to invest. Uh, the returns are very, very minimal, but you are looking into a plan where you're looking out for uh, uh, another option, then uh, you could go in for Dominica, St. Kate, uh, now here is where you pick uh, what is the price that you have to pay and what does that appeal to you and the very, very fine things about the investment options available. Obviously, if it's donation, you have to just pay them and forget it. Uh, it's as simple as that. And, and if you really would want to do that, then this is a possibility that we could do it. Um, I could hand over to my colleague, um, Surbi Mehta. Who can? Who is our international business development manager, and she can run through in no detail about uh, the citizenship options there. So over to Surbhi. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Palguni. Uh, 
I just need to make sure that all of you can hear me clearly. Mrs. Falguni, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you loud and clear. All right, perfect, perfect. So yes, as Mrs. Falguni said, we are now looking at the citizenship options. So this is a, a very clear cut route. You make investments and you directly get citizenship. You don't have to wait for five or six years so as to get your citizenship. So first, as you can see on your slides, uh, we uh, have Malta, uh, which has an, uh, a donation that you make of one million. So uh, I, I'm going to break down the donation bit for you. So you donate in funds. These are funds which are approved by the government and a donation of approximately 650,000 euros is made and you make an investment in government bonds of approximately 150,000 euros. So the donation is 650,000 euros and um, the investment is 150,000 euros. So the, the money that you're investing in government bonds is something that you get back, but the donation is something that you spend so as to get your Maltese passport and then of course then uh, there is investment in real estate that you have to make which is uh, around 350,000 now this can either be a purchased property or this can even be rental yield that you make so that completely differs and then the remaining amount is the due diligence amount right uh, speaking of uh, Cyprus citizenship again it's uh, an investment that you're making in a local business or in real estate this is again higher. This is around 2 million euros. And then we have additional due diligence fees. And then we have Bulgaria, which again, you have to make an investment in government bonds. Mind you, this is an investment in government bonds and not in real estate or any of the funds. And the, the investment, as you can see on your screens, is around 1.2 million euros. Uh, very important for us to note is uh, the biggest advantage is that the processing fee is six months. If you have the monies in place, this, these are the right options for you. Why? Because uh, you get access to the entire European market without any minimum stay requirement. There's no language barrier or anything of that sort. And within six months, you get your passport right if we are looking at the citizenship options in the Caribbean countries, then these are very interesting. Uh, what are the benefits if you ask us of uh, investing in Caribbean countries would be uh, first of all the processing time is say within three to six months you get the passport uh, it is visa free travel to approx 150 plus countries and yes a lot of these countries also include India UK uh, USA Canada so that's again an add-on um, countries like Grenada they offer extremely extremely good health care and uh, of course, there's good education in these countries as well. So when we look at St. Kitts, uh, there's a minimum investment of around 200,000 US dollars. Uh, and there's also an investment, uh, there's also a, like a donation that you make of 150,000 US dollars. Uh, speaking of Granada, we have covered this earlier as well. Granada is an E2 country, so if you invest in Granada, as you can see on your screens, um, can we please have the full slide, uh, Vaidhi? Mm, uh, I can't see the Granada option here. Yes, thank can you, you thank you so much. Question? So, yes, yes, I can see that now. Thank you so much. So, uh, Granada, yes, you make an investment of uh, to twenty thousand uh, US dollars. The biggest advantage is that if you invest in Granada, you get. Uh, a route to enter the US because Granada and US are E2 treaties. They share the E2 treaties. So if you invest here, you can actually get to the US and you can start up your business there with uh, investments as little as uh, one CR INR. So this is a good benefit because I, I, I'm not quite sure whether you've heard about the EB5 program, but the investments have gone up to around six to seven uh, crores INR. And um, I mean, if, if U.S. is an option for you, if you're looking at the U.S., then yes, Granada would definitely be the right route to get to you. It's a good, reliable uh, route. What happens is that you invest in shares in um, properties there. So this is the money that you're going to invest in property, and eventually you can enter the U.S. through this route. So that is quite interesting. Uh, covering Dominica, uh, Antigua, and all these countries, it's more or less the same thing you either make... Uh, an investment in real estate, 
which would be ranging from 200 to 250 um, thousand US dollars as you make a donation which ranges from 100 to 150 thousand US dollars so yes um, the biggest advantage like I said is the visa free travel and uh, that remains constant but uh, good thing is that the investors they are offered the same rights of freedom in these countries you know there's no minimum stay requirement and uh, all the information remains confidential so yes that's that uh, could we please have the next slide thank you so yes these are our uh, testimonials these are happy clients uh, we do have a video which we will be playing after the presentation as well uh, where our clients have lovely things to say about us so you could also refer to our website uh, there are testimonials be it uk usa canada covering all the categories all the work that our entire team has done so yes these are the happy clients that we have so we please have the next slide Can we please have the full slide? Ready? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So yes, what, what is it that I mean by assisting you in every step of the way? So um, we are a, a professional immigration law firm. We have been established since more than a decade. Uh, what we do is we do a pre-screening to understand the eligibility of our clients and we review the documentation required in order to file a successful application. So we so it's just not limited to the visa bit. We also offer in-country support So what I mean by in-country support is that uh, we help you set up your offices. We help you with VAT registrations We help with making investments schooling advice to your children so on and so forth So it's a complete hand-holding that we provide to all our clients and we like I said earlier We have an extremely strong team of lawyers an extremely strong team of documentation uh, you can refer to our website uh, to have a look at the amazing work that the entire team uh, puts, puts across to have a successful application. So yes, that is what uh, I mean by assisting in each and every step of the application. Can we please have the next slide? Thank you. So yes, so it's, uh, can we have the full slide please? thank you thank you so much yes so industry specialization we have an experienced uh, team uh, we identify the industry so it's just not the immigration industry but if you're looking at business plans uh, for the innovator visa or be it for canada or any of these countries where you need an extremely strong business plan so as to get your application through the endorsing bodies then yes we do hold expertise in that as well uh, Mr. Hemang is the director of global mobility and he does have a very strong edge in preparing business plans for all our clients. Um, in terms of objective approach, uh, we advise our clients based on, a com on, on complete honesty. So if the client is not eligible, we do tell them that uh, we, you can choose some other country or you can choose another route or, or just wait for a while until uh, you meet the eligibility criteria. So yes, it's a very objective approach that we have. In fact, we even put down everything in writing. So after our consultations, we send out client care letters where we mention each and everything, all the conversations. In fact, even the documentations which are required, everything is sent via email. So uh, it's a complete hassle-free process. When it comes, uh, so yes, facilitation skills, uh, our aim is just not uh, to have you migrate to the country, uh, but our main aim is that our clients eventually settle there, expand their business there, they gain citizenship there, and that is the kind of support that we provide. And um, it takes uh, about two to three weeks for us to prepare and submit an application. And uh, yes, when, when it comes to implement, uh, implementation, yes, we do. Like I said earlier, uh, our lawyers and documentation team is extremely efficient in implementing all the work. 
So yes, that is the advantage you have if you uh, work with smart move immigration. Uh, leaving aside uh, the expertise that Mrs. Palgini has, uh, she has uh, an expertise of almost 15 years in the immigration industry, and she has successfully sent a lot of HNIs uh, entrepreneurs to the UK, USA, in fact, all over the globe. We have clients uh, not only in India, but also in uh, Southeast, uh, from Africa, from America, and uh, yes, like I said, all across the globe. So we do hold a lot of pride. You can also uh, check out our uh, Facebook and Google ratings. They are all as close as uh, 4.9 on 5. And we do have, we're very happily, we can say that we have almost a 99% of the success rate. So yes, this is what Smart Move Immigration does. Uh, could we please have the next slide? All right, perfect. So our locations, yes, the HO, the head office operates from Mumbai. It's in Andheri, uh, in Sakinaka. Um, could we have the full slide, please? Thank you. Yes, we do have our offices in Delhi as well as Bangalore. Uh, if you have... Uh, you guys are based there you could uh, reach out to our team which is here we do also have our office in london uh, we have a virtual office there my directors my lawyers keep traveling all across the world so yes because we do have clients based across the globe uh, and yes, that that is what we do and uh, we'll be starting with a q a session if you guys have any questions or the participants if you have any questions please feel free to leave them in the chat box um um, Mr. Falgun, do you see any questions uh, popping on the chat box? Yeah, I think we kind of have replied most of the questions. Um, is there any other query? Uh, any participants would want to uh, know? We still have some time in hand where we could be able to say, take up two questions. Uh, to, So I think uh, I think um, we would end this year, uh, and we thank you very much for your time. I think huh? I, I hope you have added value. I have a presentation on my phone. What do you mean? Hello. 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 And uh, Himang ji, thank you for your presentation. Thank you, and, very, uh, much. Thank you very much for having us on your wonderful platform. It will absolutely be a pleasure uh, to be a part of your uh, Any queries from anybody or questions have been answered satisfactorily all? Anybody has any queries? If anybody wants to uh, make unmute and speak, now you can speak. Hello, Vishnu Dave. Vishnu Dave, your personal chat should not come here, please. Okay. So, uh, thank you, everybody. And uh, I mean, Palguni and Hemanki, uh, thanks a lot. And uh, for the audience, a bigger and special thanks because if audience is there, then only the speakers have any point in speaking. So with best wishes to all, and uh, we will be in touch with you, everybody. And uh, you got the future uh, programs webinar I put in the chat mode. So anybody wants to register for those, feel free to register there. And best wishes, can we conclude the session? Alguniji, yes. anything else you yes. want to add? Yes, Mr. Ramon, we can.
we can conclude the session. Okay, I, thank you. I think you have the answers to go uh, abroad as well because that was your query when we began. I hope we were able to resolve your query as well. I'm sure you found your pathway to migrate. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you. And we conclude the session. So people are requested to, uh, they can leave the meeting. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a great weekend. Stay safe. Thank you so much. Thank you.